bit about uh, why I'm giving a talk today. Because <laughs> one of the plans we had actually beginning this semester was to have a, uh, some kind of seminar series uh, every week. And uh, so we actually, we have a lot of speakers actually in line this semester. And, but unfortunately today I couldn't find the outside speaker and uh, I thought that maybe it's my responsibility to talk a little bit about <laughs> uh, what people might be interested in. And it's probably not a good idea to talk about too many of the things, too detailed things, but this is going to be a good subject uh, to talk about because people might be interested in the subject or so. Uh, also, topologists might find it interesting because many of the topologists might have a certain knowledge about, about this. So, by the way, in, in case you are interested in giving a talk, we are particularly welcome to have you as a speaker. So, probably in the spring, we have a lot of spots remaining. So, if you want to give a talk about some of these things, like an introduction to what you are doing, then we are very welcome. We cannot pay you the money. But <laughs> But if you like, we can. I can take you to a dinner <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yes, up to the limit of a certain amount. Of course, uh, per person there's a limit. But but if you like to have a free dinner, but well, you should give a talk, and then I can buy you a dinner. So that's probably the plan that we can have. Okay. So um, so what we have is uh, so I want to define first of all the ob object called the. Uh, so the title was actually having something like a higher child group. But before I talk about higher child groups, let me talk about the classical child groups first. So child groups were very, very uh, classical object nowadays. This kind of thing was defined uh, early 50s. And I think a child was a mathematician at the University of Pennsylvania. He was maybe Johns Hopkins. He moved to actually Pennsylvania at some point, probably. But uh, he studied in Germany, and uh, he was one of the pioneers of the subject. It turns out that this group became extremely foundational object, so that it's now almost everywhere appearing. So, so how do we actually work with this kind of thing? So let me give you a definition. Maybe this is not the way he defined. Uh, so x is uh, an irreducible variety, say. It's actually possible to work with uh, much more flexible situation, like a case scheme or even an abstract Nasserian scheme. So it's actually possible to work with just a, a scheme or a scheme of finite type over Z. So for instance, uh, maybe you can work with like uh, any principal ideal domains, any data kinder domains. Or like a, now I can also take k equals c, so that in each case you can take complex uh, manifolds or symplectic manifolds. Whatever you like can be actually uh, can be actually working for you for this kind of case. So let me give you a notation. Say so suppose uh, p is an integer, then x with a subscript p with a parenthesis is going to be the set of uh, a p dimensional uh, irreducible closed uh, sub varieties of x. Uh, of course, we can do the same thing for uh, superscript q, which is going to be the same, but this is a q co-dimension q irreducible closed sub varieties. And of course, uh, in case the dimension of x is known, then, the, then if the dimension of x is equal to p plus q, then the x with the superscript q is the same as x with the subscript p. So this is going to be the same kind of way of writing, uh, no, actually a different way of writing the same object. And so in case you're working with a complex manifolds, then you might probably really like to work with a p dimensional closed sub manifolds or something like that so that you can just apply the formalism here. But at some point, maybe sometimes, if it is not a projective, maybe you have some problems. But uh, in general, it's not going to be much problem. For algebraic varieties, by the definition, this kind of process is going to be very, very defined. So we define what is called uh, algebraic cycles. So this is going to be 
analog of topological cycles, the topologies generally work. Topological cycles are going to be the former z coefficient sum of objects in, in topological space, such as the closed uh, subsets. And likewise, we can define the uh, four dimension Q, for instance, algebraic cycles of X. And that's going to be just a free abelian group on this set of Q codimension Q reducible sub varieties, or you can actually write uh, Z with a subscript P to be Z with X subscript P. So this is just nothing but the former sum of P dimensional sub varieties of <coughs> X. So that's actually what we work with. And, uh, but this is a free abelian group, and generally free abelian groups are not very interesting to work with. So we need some relations to, to have interesting structure. So we define what is called a, uh, uh, this is now very uh, roughly actually maybe. Let me sketch the idea. So, so let's say let Z1 and Z2 be two cycles of dimension P in ZPX. And we say, and Z1 and Z2 are rationally equivalent, equivalent, and write probably Z1, Z2 with a small red here. Uh, small red is generally called as a mouse, of course. But, but uh, if we have the following kind of uh, property. So uh, here I should be a little bit um, loose. So if there exists a cycle Z of one dimension higher, Z P plus one of, uh, of X cross some affine line uh, such that So say z, parenthesis is a zero here. This one means that uh, this is going to be z intersected with here. This guy has a coordinate t, and t is zero, and t is one give you certain divisors on x cross a1, such as varieties. So we intersect it with this guy. Of course, intersection requires some, some kind of condition, some kind of interesting condition to have a well-defined one. But suppose that's well-defined, and then we take those intersections. And if there exists such a z for which we have, if I intersect z with t is 0, and we got z1. And if I intersect z with 1, then we got this one. So the situation is that uh, if you are familiar with the family of objects, this is f and line. Then we have two points, 0 and 1. Actually, this doesn't really matter. You can choose any two points two distinct points on the affine line, and you can intersect, and you can give, get the same thing, because A1 can be stretched by uh, having some automorphisms. And here, uh, Z can be seen as a family of actually objects. So Z is a family of cycles of dimension P. And now, this one says, here this is Z1, and here I have Z2. So in other words, Topologically speaking, if we have this kind of relationship, then you can say that Z1 is cobordon to Z2. Of course, cobordism is much weaker than this one, but certainly this one implies that Z1 is cobordon to Z2, if that is working with a complex manifold. So if you have this relationship, we call it actually rational equivalence. And of course, there is an equivalent algebraic way of defining this. That's actually where the name rational actually coming from. So this one requires a little bit of uh, algebraic gadget because, uh, because uh, Z here doesn't have to be some nice property. And of course, uh, whenever we are given such a Z, then uh, the algebraic geometers know very well that there is a process called the normalization. And I think commutative algebraists know this one very well as well. Normalization just means that whenever you are having an integral domain, then you can actually take a it's a function field and take the integral closure of that ring. 
So that's a normalization, and it's, it, it's an easy exercise that normalization is always unique up to isomorphism because of certain universal property. So Z is a variety, but it doesn't have to be uh, normal. And to talk about certain kind of order of vanishing, we need at least normal variety. So we take a normalization, and then what is good about this is that the function field is not going to be changing. The function field of this Z is the same as the normalization. So function fields are not changing, whereas the varieties are no, now normal. So that you can talk about whenever you are given a rational function, you can talk about order of vanishing along a divisor, or order of poles along a divisor. So that's where, where the normalization is playing the role. And then, uh, so then, uh, this condition of rational equivalence is actually the same as saying that Z1 minus Z2 is actually given by, by a divisor of a rational function. But of course, I have to push it forward because now what is happening over here is going to be uh, actually what's happening over Z tilde. So this is going to be, this, this is, uh, this is uh, the divisor of zeros of F minus divisor of poles of f. That makes sense because it's a normal variety. And then we have this thing. So this, we can take the image of that one over here. And that's going to be actually this. So in other words, if we have a rational equivalence, then uh, z1 and z2 are equivalent. It can be written as, a, as a, this the divisor of a certain rational function. So that's why it's called the rational, e rational equivalence. And there are nowadays the weaker ones over here, but uh, let me talk about it later. So here's the definition. So we know what to say about uh, rational equivalence. So the, the child group, the child group of dimension P on X is so they are written, they are written as a CHP with uh, X. Uh, classically, people wrote actually AP of X. And that's probably what uh, Chow originally wrote. Or also, if you look at the Fulton's intersection theory, that's also the notation. Second definition, you, uh. you don't need the P to be the dimension divisors. Oh. Oh, yeah, so here, of course, this guy should be a uh, dimension uh, uh, plus one. Yeah, of course. Uh, so, so this part is actually still the same. I'm just replacing this part by this part. Okay. <laughs> so, this, yeah, so here, this part is equivalent to this part. Yes. Right. So, otherwise, we have a certain strange situation, of course. So, because these guys have dimension p. How can a rational function defined on a bigger space have a divisor that is not of dimension p? So that's right. Yeah, so z is of dimension p plus 1, which is this situation. OK, so now uh, well, this is actually the classical notation for the Chow ring. And uh, Fulton actually uses this one if you look at the intersection theory of Fulton. Uh, but nowadays, people use this ch with a subscript p. And that's going to be the defined to be a ZP of X, so algebraic cycles of dimension P modulo this rational equivalence. So that's actually how we define. But what on oh. Okay. Well, maybe you're going to talk about this later. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But for the, the first definition you gave, uh -huh. uh, so what I would like to do is to push uh -huh. this, this Z, uh -huh. to push it to X, to project down to, to X. Uh -huh. So, I mean, that, I that's right. Say about this? Like, that, that's right. I, I, I said this way roughly. Roughly here means that yeah. actually there should be some more clear, precise mathematical definition of this one. But uh, this is just uh, explaining what the uh, idea behind this one is. Okay, but, but uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm thinking like there's something, uh -huh. a difference with, between this and uh -huh. doing it uh, like, like a topological way. Uh -huh. topology, topology, you don't need to lift to the product. Uh -huh. like this, right. Uh huh. So, anything like can you push down or make a more complicated definition? That, that's right. Yeah, get you precisely. Um, this is very loose actually way of saying. So this one should be actually written as uh, I intersect this thing over here. That's going to actually still lie in x cross something, and then I push it down to actually x using the natural map. 
uh, there's a natural projection from x cross a1 to x, and then use that push forward but to x. Proper, so uh, it's not proper, but in this case, it makes sense. That's going to be what we need to verify, actually. So this definition, which is written over here, requires certain kind of technical issues. This is much better algebraically because it doesn't require any further conditions. So that's why actually why this is much more convenient to prove certain things, whereas this one requires certain geometrical intricacies that people have to handle a little bit. So that's actually why I said roughly. Yes, but, uh, but uh, anyways, uh, Fulton's intersection theory discusses this one in, in very much in detail. It gives even two equivalent definitions. Of course, because uh, the thing is that the group of rational equivalencies requires some definition which is not as simple as this. I'm just giving you only the idea of this one. Okay. Right, so let me give you certain examples that people might be actually more familiar with. So here is a one example. So suppose that x is a smooth curve. So here, smooth curve over a field k. But if you want, you can think of it as a kind of like a x is a compact uh, Riemann surface that, in case you are uh, taking my algebraic geometry course, then this is the object we are, we are learning about at this moment, for all of the compact Riemann surfaces are smooth algebraic curves. So we have this thing. And uh, of course, we didn't define this one yet because we are not even around here, but we will define it very soon. So Z0 is a zero dimension cycle. And we have, this is going to just nothing but the free abelian group on the points of X. And people generally call it divisors on curves, but divisors are just generally typically just co-dimension one cycles. That's actually what people classically call. And then uh, we have actually a very compact way of saying what the rational equivalence is in this particular case of dimension one. Then the two divisors, D1 and D2 are say divisors. are rationally equivalent, have this D1 equivalent D2 uh, rationally, if and only if actually D1 minus D2 is actually same as given by the divisor of the function f, which is kind of different, a little bit different from this. But I didn't really say the x is z is something particular. Here, I require that x is going to something that comes from x cross a1. You're saying that z0 is a, that's, what do you mean by divisor? This is a point generated by a point in that point. Right, so, so, def, so we, we call these things the divisor. That's what, a, what do you mean by the point? Divisor is a, one. yes, the divisor. So when we say the variety is given, mm -hmm. a divisor is a, just a co-dimension one cycle. Mm -hmm. That's a definition of but divisor. Why is the, what does it have anything to do with the points in it? So this is a formal sum of divisors. So here, the variety has dimension one. So co-dimension one is now the oh, point. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Right, so the co-dimension one is now point. Okay. So this is just an abstract uh, sum of points. Mm -hmm. so, so in this case, this is going to be actually the same as having only a rational function f on the, on the function field of this curve. And we take this one. And, but if you actually cleverly look at uh, some of the series defined on uh, curves, then you might realize this is actually sometimes called the linear equivalence. So this is actually equivalent to, say, uh, there's a linear equivalence. So linear D2, which is kind of much more classical terminology for uh, algebraic geometers. So linear equivalence for core dimension one cycles is the same as the rational equivalence. That's actually what uh, we actually get. And so in each case, the child group of co-dimension one thing is going to be actually, uh, so one thing that we also know is that each divisor on a curve is given, giving actually a one line bundle. So co-dimension one cycles give us the line bundles, and the line bundles collected with uh, up to isomorphism is going to generally be referred to as a Picard group. So this is going to be the group of line bundles up to isomorphism. 
that's going to be multiplicative group, and that's actually exactly the same as the child one. And also, of course, uh, we were discussing this one actually in my class uh, yesterday, and that's going to be also the same as this kind of thing. That maybe uh, so. But the one point is that um, this fellow already contains a lot of information about the structure of the graph, of, uh, the curve of x. So this is probably a classical object. And of course, uh, if you are, uh, say, doing some number theory or some ring case where a is an abstract Dedekind domain, say, here I did not actually use any assumption that the base is actually over k. So I can actually work with the abstract Dedekind domain of dimension 1. Is a this one, this identity, oh. this is for arbitrary smooth oh. variety oh. x. Oh. Yes, oh. actually, not not even for the curve. Okay. It's actually true for arbitrary case, and so that's right. So you, you can actually work with arbitrary Dedekind domain, not even defined over k. It's over z. For instance, the ring of integers. See, ring of integers then you can actually apply the same machine. Then ring of integers, you can actually prove that very easily. Child 1 of x is, of course, uh, same as uh, the fractional ideas, fractional ideas uh, of A modulo the integral ideas, which is generally referred to as a divisor class group which is written as a CL of A. So in the number theory, there is a divisor class group uh, whose order is going to call the class number. The class number is precisely just nothing but the size of this child one. Of course, uh, in case of algebraic number field, we have a ring of integer that has a finite thing. But generally, this kind of group is extremely large. For instance, even for a smooth uh, compact Riemann surface. This guy actually even contains uh, as a sub variety, subset, a Jacobian variety, which is a very, very high dimension. It's the dimension of genus G. Uh, so if X is of genus G, then the dimension of this guy is going to be actually G, so that it's far from being a finite set. But, but anyways, you can see a lot of classical objects in this uh, child group situation. Okay, so. But there is one usage of this thing um, where you might be very much familiar with. So in case, for instance, suppose uh, now x is suppose uh, smooth. Maybe for simplicity, say projective, but it's not quite <coughs> necessary. Complex manifold. <coughs> and of course, smooth is not necessary because manifold already means that it's smooth. And suppose of dimension 2D. Then uh, what we do know actually is that for, let's say, suppose that z is a closed submanifold, submanifold, or maybe variety if you like, of dim core dimension q. Then uh, from algebraic topology, what we do know is that we can always construct a fundamental cohomology class in any given co nice cohomology theory. So we have, we have. We, we need some kind of tools to prove this thing. But we have, and in any case, a cohomology class. Actually, we do have a homology class first. And then we can use the Poincare duality to get the uh, result. But the homology class, which is lying in, which is denoted by z, called the fundamental class. And that's going to be, uh, say, for instance, in the drum cohomology, we have 2q of x with, uh, say, uh, c, with, uh, say. Or if you like, you can take a singular cohomology with 2q for dimension, and you have this z as well. Whatever cohomology theory you use, you are going to be getting a fundamental class. And that's actually one of the things people actually use. Of course, we can actually use this uh, one of the fact, like a point. Is it compact? 
uh, is uh, so that probably it closed, that means it closed means th yes, that's yeah. right. So probably it's a good idea to keep a projective here so that forcing everything to be compact whenever you have a closedness. But uh, so what do you mean by closed? Closed in algebraic sense or closed in logical sense? If it is a closed in algebraic sense, it is automatically closed in logical sense. Okay. Especially if it is a projective, okay. it is going to be automatically projective as well. So, well, uh, anyway, we have this kind of cohomology class, and uh, uh, of course, uh, this guy is a very interesting objective. So like uh, one of the way of defining Durand cohomology is to use smooth differential forms, but you can actually use currents. Smooth currents, currents are the functionals defined on the form in the space of uh, forms, smooth forms. And so, for instance, you can actually regard this thing same as integration over z, which is a functional on the on the on the space of currents or the complex of currents. And so that uh, this guy is an integration over z is sort of given giving this kind of fundamental class in the cohomology class, which is going to be actually very very uh, nice property, but uh, but not this not this one, but a much better one is going to be this. And so probably it's not very much interesting to most people, but one of the things things people can prove is this. We can prove is is that if uh, z one. So we can extend this one z linearly, so that for an arbitrary algebraic cycle on x, we can define the fundamental class of the cycle. But if this is rationally equivalent, then we have the same fundamental class of these two cycles, which is actually not very difficult to prove. Yeah, that's right. This is a class group. Oh, you're right. Oh, sorry, yes. That's a principal idea, right? That's right. Yes, this would be principal ideas, right? So all of these fraction ideas generated by two, right? I think I made a mistake. Right. So this is a, fra fra a principal idea. Right. <laughs> so because uh, the things that look like these things are generally called the principal devices. So we have principal devices, and they are just analog of principal ideas. But anyways, we have this situation. And the proof of this kind of thing is not extremely t difficult for topologists because if I have, so as I said, we have uh, this covalent situation. So you actually have Z1 and Z2. And we have some kind of topological space that bound these two cycles. So roughly speaking, that's going to be actually giving us contraction of homology classes, cohomology classes. And actually, you realize that there is a better notion for homological purposes which is going to be called the algebraic equivalence, algebraic rational equivalence on cycles. So here the idea is that, so I, if I have a two cycles in the dimension P case, in the previous case, I considered now P plus one dimension one with X cross A1. But instead of using this A1, I just use any curve. Of course, the curves might have a certain genus. So this is genus 0. So <coughs> it might have a higher genus. And I have actually Z. Then Z1 is algebraically equivalent to Z2 if there is such a Z such that. Z1 minus Z2 is going to be, uh, sorry, Z1 is given by Z intersected with a certain point P, and Z2 is in, given by Z intersected with a certain point Q, where P and Q are points on the curve. So we actually still have a parameterization by the curve, and uh, cycles can be actually seen as parameterized by C. And then we intersect with the P and Q to get Z1 and Z2. And of course, you do see that we do have a still uh, Cobordon situation. So this is called the algebraic equivalence. But the easy consequence is that uh, algebraic equivalence still gives you uh, uh, still gives you the same fundamental classes 
Well, in any case, this is actually a uh, much weaker equivalence relation, which is less, less fine. So this is much finer than this algebraic equivalence. So, so actually, this one implies that anyway, uh, if I have a co-dimension Q thing, then this one actually maps to not just the previous one. Uh, so maybe it's better to say. So we have a cycle class map, ZPX. Here, that maps to fundamental classes. This is called a cycle class map. And we write it as a gamma of x to h2q of certain cohomology of x with certain coefficient. And that actually factors through, uh, actually, to uh, chow q of x. And that even further factors through chow qx with the algebraic equivalence. So that's actually what we have in this situation. So this cycle class map factors through this uh, child group or the child group with the algebraic equivalence. Um, so that sort of explains what we have something to do, what kind of things we have to do with the uh, cohomology series. So in other words, uh, whenever we have a certain cohomology series that has uh, reasonable properties like uh, Boincare duality and various other axioms, then we do want to construct certain cohomology class maps from the child groups. And if we have reasonably good cohomology theory, then actually it factors through the child groups or rational uh, child group, an uh, algebraic child group. So, and we have actually some further properties that might probably encourage you want to define what is now called the higher child groups. Just a minor question. Right. What is your notation in B? Uh, it, <laughs> uh, so this one, this one means uh, this one means a nota bene. So it's a Latin nota means a note, bene means well. This means not well. So, 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 right. Okay. So. <laughs> right. So um, here are some more properties. Some properties uh, of. of child groups. Uh, so here, in most cases, we want to restrict the case when x is a smooth variety, if you like, a manifold. And one of the properties we actually have is that uh, we cannot, however, expect a full homotopy invariance kind of thing. Child groups are good enough uh, for certain purposes, but uh, we, we certainly do know that uh, for Manifolds, for instance, if two manifolds are homotopically equivalent, they do have the same cohomology groups, singular cohomologies or Durand cohomologies. But child groups are much, much more rigid than that. So here, if factors through algebraic equivalence, uh, here, however, rational equivalence, as you can see over here, is a little bit, by definition, more, much finer than this uh, algebraic equivalence. So we will never have some kind of homotopy equivalence that is too strong. But we do have this kind of homotopy invariance, which is called the A1 homotopy invariance. And first of all, with this one, uh, we can actually prove that, suppose now this time Z is a smooth closed subvariety, and U is a complement, then we can actually have a, uh, this kind of sequence, which is looking like a Maya Vitoris kind of sequence that so we have this property. So if I have p dimensional cycles on Z, then using this push forward inclusions, we can regard these cycles as the cycles here. And then we have an open subset. So for open subsets, so whenever you are given a cycle on x, we can restrict it onto an open subset. That's the this map. X minus z or x minus z? Oh, <laughs> x minus z, yes. This is an open complement of. So this is a very, very, this map is very natural. That's very natural. And this is going to be exact sequence that we can, we can prove very easily. And so that's actually one of the properties. And 
one of the things that we can actually prove, combining 1 plus 2 plus some induction, we can actually prove that uh, if E is any uh, affine bundle, so for instance, uh, a vector bundle is going to be an example of affine bundle, then we have this bundle have a child group that is isomorphic to the child group of uh, the base space. So we can use the induction on the rank of this vector affine bundle and use uh, also at the same time the Noetherian induction on this dimension of variety. So we need the induction on the rank and the dimension of the base space at the same time and we can use that to prove this kind of thing. So we do have some kind of homotopy invariance. Whenever you have a vector bundle, we can shrink it to the base space to get the same child group, but not as flexible as a topological Ooh, situation. Is, uh, only have this uh, four line, four term exactness. That's right. So that's actually why we need, uh, for instance, higher child group. So we are having right exact sequence here, but we don't yet have a left exact sequence here. It's not exact here. So the main, one of the main reasons about the developing the theory of higher child group was actually to see what happens here on the left. It's not left exact. It actually comes with certain terms. And it is going to be actually long exact sequence, which is kind of like a Maya Vitoris sequence. Maya Vitoris sequence at infinite length. But that cannot be described in the, in the range of child groups. That's a problem. So that actually explains why we need uh, such a kind of, uh, of structure. Of course, so we have other extra structures, number four, like a child uh, px tensor with the child q x maps to child p plus q x. There is a product structure, that's your natural product structure, x is smooth. And that's going to actually the first thing Chow proved. And he proved it using what he called the Chow's moving lemma. So what, what was the point of that is that, uh, so if I have a cycle of co-dimension P here and co-dimension Q here, then naturally I want to intersect these two to produce a cycle of co-dimension P plus Q. If that is well defined, that's going to be a nice product. But the trouble is that sometimes we might have a really bad situation. Suppose I have this kind of thing, and suppose something is lying over here. Then intersection of these two will be actually a smaller one. That's not going to be a good idea, because suppose if, I, if this guy has a co-dimension 1, this guy has a co-dimension 2, then co-dimension is not properly adding up. So in that kind of situation, the product structure is going to be twisted. So what he proved is that, we can actually move one of these two things suitably using rational equivalence so that uh, the product is well defined and that is well defined up to rational equivalence. And that actually requires a lot of work. It's kind of like a size lemma in differential geometry. We can move like it's a little bit up to rational equivalence so we can intersect it. That's right. But it's a little bit hard actually to prove it algebraically. I can move close to varieties. What about, can you see this uh, cohomology? cohomology? In, so I think in, in terms of cohomology classes, we have certain better tools. Like, uh, for instance, we have, if I move certain, so if I have a manifold, I can sort of like, a, like a fluctuate things a little bit using up to homotopy equivalence. Like I think uh, uh, when people define this kind of intersection product, people use that kind of argument, transversality kind of lemma. And, uh, People usually use normal bundle to do that. Yeah, but what I'm asking is, when yeah. this is cohomology, uh -huh. you, are, you are using cohomology, right. then you can have <coughs> two P and Q dimensional self-like right. product. Right. And then does it have any tensor product structure? Uh, I mean, I mean, so, so, so in, in the child okay. groups, this one right. In, in the child group case, this is actually the same as the dimension of of uh, x minus p. So homology and cohomology have no distinction at all. They have no distinction. <laughs> so here the cohomology is the same as homology. That's right. We can always do that. Here, child groups are flexible in the sense that. Right. Like, uh, in, in homology, you have product space, I guess, right. Product. 
Ah, all oh, right. Actually, so uh, so what actually happens here is that we are not actually doing this, but we can actually make an external product over here with the cross and y, and then we can actually map it to. Uh, in case if if x is equal to y, then we have a certain uh, diagonal map, and using the diagonal map, we are going to be defining the product structure again. So so that's probably much better way. We can take a product and then, then which is the same as moving. Then take a product and then. Oh, take, that's right, and then we can pull back through the diagonal, ah, and that's another way of defining this this child class. But this is actually the same. The problem is still the same. X is embedded into some bigger space, X cross X. And then now I have to intersect this diagonal with uh, the product cycle, which is causing the same kind of problem. So in any case, I have to move a certain cycle properly to different positions so that I can intersect properly in the right core dimension. So there is the product structure, and that's actually requiring a lot of work. And, but anyways, this one actually says, this is a graded ring. When you move things around, do you, you get something that is, you can express in terms of transversality? Is it some sort of strati stratified version of transversality? Uh, it's almost never transversal. It's just uh, because the thing is that, so here, for instance, algebraic varieties can have intersection like this. This is not transversal, but this is still good enough for us because it has the right code dimension. So we totally ignore certain issues about smoothness. Mm -hmm. Tangential intersection is fine, because at least it has a good dimension. But so um, maybe we can do this kind of transversal thing. But I don't think that people are interested in that issue. Maybe having this intersection is already making people so tired. <laughs> so then, and it gives a good theory, so that they are not too much concerned of having this. But I'm sure that it should be possible. I don't think that this is actually like, probably yes. That's right. So this is a moving lemma, but this kind of thing is called the Bottini's lemma. But that requires a little bit harder work. I don't think that, however, this is destroying the theory. This is good enough for us. So. Uh, okay. So that's right. So then, uh, and uh, there are other kind of properties, but I think that the time is actually going uh, too fast. So maybe. Uh, what I should probably do is uh, to say some words about what to do with, with this kind of thing. Especially, there are several motivations about higher child groups, but the lack of left exact sequence here is going to be the main motivation. So uh, let me just drop some other motivations because we don't have much time. So let me say, uh, so the question is, uh, in two, is there a theory of algebraic cycles that makes the sequence long exact? And the answer is actually yes. And it was done during the 80s. Of course, there was a gap in the proof so that people have to spend 10 more years to prove uh, the correct uh, the problem. But the, uh, the statement was not false, but the, the technical issues was actually difficult. But the, the main difficulty was actually proving this kind of moving lemma kind of thing that uh, made people have a hard time. So, so that's going to be actually, the answer is yes. And that's going to be called the higher uh, chow groups. So they are denoted by chow q with x, but it has an extra index n here. So n is going to be non-negative. And for instance, and one property is that and chow q of x0 is going to be the usual chow group. And the second property is that indeed it solves the problem. So in the same situation as before, z and x are smooth. And this is a closed. And u is the complement of z. Then we have a long exact sequence. So we had a chow q uh, x, oh, sorry. So we have a chow q 
qzn that maps to chow qxn that maps to chow qun and there is a connecting map to chow q of z with n minus 1 and chow q of x and n minus 1 it goes until this index, second index becomes zero, where we have this classical situation. So that's possible. And, uh, and how do we construct? So how do we construct this kind of thing is actually the issue, how to construct such a. And unlike the name, it suggests maybe it's actually much easier to construct than it appears. So let me give you actually the definition. The, the definition it has actually the idea from the definition of singular homology. But of course, the varieties have a very, very stupid topology called the Jariski topology, which is too rigid, maybe, to have a lot of morphisms, so that uh, we need some kind of change from that. But let me just recall briefly what singular homology was. For well, the singular homology, we had this simplex space. The simplex space was uh, the collection of points in Rn plus 1, where the xi's are all non-negative, and the sum of the coordinates are going to be equal to 1. So that's going to be the algebraic simplex. For instance, if I have n is 1, then the interval between this point and that point is going to be your delta 1. And x is an arbitrary topological space, then you can define a and singular simplex. So x is a topological space, then a singular and simplex is a continuous map from delta n to x. And you take a Sn of x to be the free abelian group on all of these singular and simplices. And of course, the great thing about this construction is that you have a certain uh, structure of simplicial object so that you have intersections with the various faces to get an object and s n minus 1 of x. Of course, if you have this kind of thing, so here we have various bound, like a face maps. And you can take simply uh, partial to be the alternating sum of those faces so that you get a complex. So s star of x with the partial is a complex. And its homology is the singular homology of uh, x with a d coefficient, of course, that's a definition. So we're trying to modify this one a little bit. So singular homology defined using those singular n simplices, and we got immediate problems here. So we have at least two problems, and problem number one is that, suppose now x is a variety, so x is now a variety, then one problem is that this fellow delta n is not going to be an algebraic variety anymore. It's a, it's a topological space. So we need a different space. So we, maybe we can define delta n to be a different set of points. And that's actually the way we define it is actually, what you can actually realize out of this structure is that what matters is these boundary face maps, not the, the shape of the topological space itself. So algebraic formalism coming out of this simplicial object is what is important. So we try to imitate this one. So we actually consider this delta n to be the spectrum of, we forget about inequalities, but we consider only, first of all, the affine space, just like we consider our n plus 1. And inequality here has no meaning in algebraic geometry. We forget about that, and we just look at only this. So that's going to be actually a line here not the interval. So the sum of ti's is 1. So that's going to be called the algebraic simplex of dimension n. 
But great thing about this is that we have a lot of faces actually here that map to delta n minus 1. And we also have a degeneracies. Now, this co-simplicial structure is making things work. So we use this co-simplicial structure. So that's actually solving one problem. But one other problem is that uh, still, uh, I want to now consider this algebraic simplex. And x is a variety. And if I just try to re look at only the morphisms of varieties, then we again have a problem here. Because uh, uh, unlike this case where we have topological spaces, uh, algebraic variety, morphism of varieties are too scarce. Sometimes if x is really bad, there might be almost nothing here. There might be almost nothing. So the problem here is the second problem is that if in CIS, if f is uh, morphism of varieties, then there are too few such f. So that the corresponding homology theory is going to be a really silly thing to calculate. So the modification that we make is, is that uh, for algebraic geometers, it's quite common to regard the morphism as a graph over the product space. And topologically, it is making sense as well. So uh, instead of taking these morphisms, I actually take the product space. And the product space has a lot of, so I regard this thing as an algebraic variety, and take cycles here. And these cycles are called the correspondences, correspondences. And the correspondences now play the role of morphisms instead of the actual morphisms. So we take a algebraic cycles on x cross. So we take the cycles zp on x cross partial delta n. But the other problem here is that now there are actually too many cycles. Previously, we had a too few morphisms. Now we have too many cycles. So this guy has too many cycles. So instead, we actually take a subgroup of this one. So zp of x with a subscript, you know, actually comma n. And that's going to be the group of cycles on x cross delta n such that uh, they intersect faces properly. So here, proper intersection means it, the, the previous problem that causes the difficulty in defining Cho ring, that kind of problem doesn't appear. Here, the main problem is that to define something that is similar to this, we need to intersect a cycle here with a face map. But what if the intersection with the face is bad? If it doesn't give us the right co-dimension, then we have a problem. So that we force the condition that the cycle's correspondences intersect the faces properly, then this guy actually indeed give us a intersection with a face. And that actually gives us a, a complex that looks like this. So it does uh, give a complex. So its homology is going to be denoted by this, chow with subscript p with a double index n is a homology of this complex. And what is actually, uh, I cannot really explain all of this uh, because of the time problem, but uh, um, it turns out that just like the we previously we talked about the fact that we have a cycle class map that maps to arbitrary cohomology theory that factors through the child group. And that's those kind of cohomology series are generally called the value cohomology series. And value cohomology series are cohomology series with the nice properties such as the dimension axiom, one-color duality, QNS formula, and these kind of things. And 
there is a much more general notion of value cohomologies. And this cohomology, this homology theory actually turned out to be satisfying that kind of universal property. Whenever you have a reasonable set of cohomology theory, and if I have a nice chunk character map, then this is going to the place where everything factors through. So uh, that's actually what people uh, were studying. And it turns out that the, the theorem, uh, one of the theorems about this higher child group was that, uh, so in case x is smooth, this is probably this is here by Wojcicki. Uh, so this group, x is smooth, then chow uh, q x n has well, some kind of universal property. Property. So that that is isomorphic to what he defined uh, as something called the motivic homologies. This motivic homology for variety was previously the conjectural homology theory that has certain factorization universal property from the chunk character maps to over the Quillen case theory to arbitrary nice cohomology theory. And it turns out that this group actually that we have just defined has this property. The definition of this guy was reasonably simple enough. We just take the algebraic simplex and the correspondences with the certain properties. And this one actually turned out to satisfy the, the universal property we actually wanted. So probably, uh, that might probably explain what this one has to do with these uh, the child groups and uh, the classical objects and, and stuff. So, so algebraic varieties, if we want to study uh, from the cohomological point of view, this is probably certainly the object that we have to look at. That's what everyone was actually saying. So, so I guess so probably I cannot talk about other things, but maybe I should stop because the time is up. <laughs> so. It's a, uh, it was done during the uh, late 90s, but published in 2002. It's very recent. He won the Fisher Prize for these kind of works. So it's very recent. But uh, certainly he did a lot more things than this. But, uh, but he constructed a category called uh, the category of triangular category of geometric motifs that actually satisfy certain axioms. And out of that, he defined the motivic cohomology. From his definition, uh, that cohomology group is expected to satisfy certain list of properties that any cohomology theory must satisfy. And then he proved that this group that he defined is isomorphic to this group. So it's, a, it's very topological. The proof is just very topological. He constructed some kind of homotopy category of some early objects and then calculated the X group of that thing. And nobody wants to read that paper probably, but he actually proved that this is isomorphic to this, this group. So, uh, Chao group, or classical Chao group, is yes. higher type of Chao group. Right. And both of them are, of course, isomorphic invariants. Uh, of course, yes. Yeah, but is there any weak invariants? Um, some people try to find, uh, so I, I talked about some something. Right, so I, I talk, this is a rational equivalent analog. I talked about also algebraic analog, uh, algebraic equivalents using instead of A1, I can use the arbitrary curve. And that's sort of similar to uh, homological equivalence, which is kind of like a topological sense, the cobodism thing, which is actually conjecture. That's actually not a thing that was proven. There, there is a list of conjectures about those cycles called the standard conjectures of growth, and they, most of them are not proven. And one of the things is that, uh, what ki regardless of what kind of cohomology theory we are going to be using, actually, homological invariance is going to be coming from homotopic invariance, homotopic equivalence. But from the cohomology group, say, for instance, whatever cohomology we use, we can declare that two things are uh, homologically equivalent if their cohomology classes are the same. One of the conjecture is going to be that uh, if, if that's the case, then they have the same algebraic equivalence classes, but the, that's not proven. It's too difficult to show at this moment. And uh, yeah, so in, in case X is a complex manifold, complex variety. If F is a complex projective variety that is smooth, then 
we can also use these uh, Duranko homology stuffs as well. Then we can define, uh, say, say D1 and Z2 uh, homological equivalent. Uh, of course, homological equivalence a priori requires us to choose one cohomology theory, like a singular cohomology or terrain cohomology. Then we say that they are homologically equivalent if their classes with respect to that cohomology group, their cohomology classes are actually equal. But one conjecture is that if they are homologically equivalent, then they should be algebraically equivalent to two. So there should exist a curve that actually bound both of them. But that's actually very, very different nature because the homological equivalence requires us to pick one particular cohomology class, cohomology theory, like a Duran cohomology or singular cohomology. But the conjecture is saying that now that homological equivalence is independent of choice of any of the cohomology theory. So that's actually why this is so difficult actually. But I don't think that there is anything weaker than this one yet. There were some other kind of equivalences, like an important equivalence of Voivodsky and these. And, but uh, uh, it, it turns out that the rational equivalence turns out to be the finest one subject to a certain list of axioms. So you are just talking about the elements in the, in the child group, right? Uh-huh. But what about the child group holds it all itself? Does it, it, does it tell anything about the x, the original x, the space x? Uh, Right, so, so if x is given, we can consider all uh, direct sum of all child groups. And so are you asking if we can recover x from this information of yeah, the group? how much do you know? So in other words, uh, uh, in mm -hmm. uh, I mean, topology, uh -huh. you have manifold, you know, right. homology or cohomology, and you know much about cohomology, right. how much can you know about this manifold? Oh, uh, why? Is not this child group is designed for the d determining this stuff. Right. Right, 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 right. Um, what we can say is that if in case x is smooth, then we cannot tell the difference between x and its bundle over x. Of course, yeah, of course be because of this is homotopy invariance. It's a1 homotopy, so we cannot tell the difference between these two. Of course, x and y are isomorphic, then they are child. That's right. <laughs> Right. Maybe if x and y are rationally So certain results about birational class were calculated, but it's not a birational invariant. Oh, right. It's not a birational invariant. Certain very strong, very strong. That's right. But there is a point to try to do that. But in, in general, yes, there are certain cases that we have no idea about. So the main advantage of a higher child group is you have this long sequence. That's right. And also, uh, one thing that is that uh, the Quillen has defined what is called algebraic case theory in the early 70s. And one property that I did not talk about is the Chow group uh, of the tensor with the Q gives a description of the gross index group, which is K0. That's called the gross index Riemann Rock theorem. And for arbitrary higher K groups, we have a similar gross index uh, Riemann Rock theorem. And uh, that's going to be giving us a way of describing uh, those homotopy groups in terms of those algebraic cycles, which is actually doing upward things. Generally, people, homotopical invariants have much, much, much stronger information. But if I tensor with the Q so that I can, I kill all of the torsions, then those homotopy groups can be expressed in terms of those algebraic cycles. So that's actually one of the consequences of those higher child groups. So that's... This First, child group, child group is uh, card group. Uh, Comol, yes, yes, that's right. What about higher? Does it have any? So, C H one of X and does uh, that, any So there, there are certain. Uh, it's very not very easy to actually describe certain cases. Uh, so, for instance, the child one uh, X uh, with uh, one. This is easy. This is uh, like a child one. Uh, x0 was a Picard group of x when x is smooth. This one is actually the global section of x with a OX star. So we can probably, so if you think of this as h1 of x and OX star, then you realize that as indices actually grow up, then this one becomes, uh, this is 1 and this is a 0. So that's actually going backward. That's actually one thing. And it is proven that h1 of x and uh, n is zero if n is greater than equal to two. 
Because uh, apparently one way of thinking about it is that uh, there is no negative cohomology. <coughs> but this is the way we actually look at. Um, but uh, there should exist, if the conjecture that there should exist some kind of negative K theory, then might actually give us certain steps over here. Of course, we can go up. <laughs> here, we have no idea to go up because uh, we don't actually define varieties of dimension negative which is kind of weird to talk about here. But there should be a clever way of certain uh, dualizing object that may allow us to define certain object with a negative indices here, which is a very deep problem. And it be conjecture or? Um, people are working on that, especially like a topologist mostly. They are working on negative K series. And negative K theory uh, is going to be some object. But the, the thing is the negative K theory is, uh, is, work, is a non-zero only when x is not smooth. So it is proven that if there is a such a proposed theory of negative k theory, then that should be zero if x is smooth. So that means that we cannot expect to have something non-zero over here. So it is actually a way of understanding singular varieties. So that's actually what people are doing. Uh, surprisingly, only topologists have been working on that, not the uh, algebraic geometers. So the questions. <laughs> <laughs>